Buttock pain, aka piriformis syndrome, has an abundance of content online. However, there is a lot of stuff that might be making it worse. So in this video, we're going to go through the do's, the don'ts, stretches and exercises that will help and also those to probably avoid because it might be making symptoms worse. More importantly, trying to identify with that buttock pain, where could it be coming from, what could be causing it and importantly, trying to understand how to manage it. So buttock pain has been around for ages and there are so many different causes, but the problem is there's a lot that will make it worse. And often those things that do make it worse come down to really some simple points and ultimately comes down to managing it or treating it as something when it isn't. Now the piriformis gets blamed for, I would say, 99% of people who have buttock pain, but there is so much more going around that. And you'll be surprised when we go into the exercise management and some guidance from a rehab perspective later, a lot of the things that I tend to tell patients to be aware of or cautious of or possibly to avoid actually is the thing that makes up quite a lot of the content online when it comes to management. So let's dive into first all the different things that might be possibly related or causing someone to have buttock pain. Now, buttock pain could be anywhere in that glute max area. You know, that glute max could be the source of pain as a number of causes driving it. We've got the hip for starters. We've got the lower back. We've got other things such as the sacroiliac joint that could be driving and referring pain into that area. From that component, we've also got to consider things like joint pain, soft tissue pain, nerve pain, inflammatory pain. All of these things can present in a certain way. Whether you've got tendon related pain from your glute medius that's referring into the buttock, whether you've got nerve pain from your lumbar spine and the discs that's referring into the buttock, or even just the joints from the lumbar spine referring into the buttocks. It's really important to understand that all of these things may well present with pain in the same area of where your piriformis is. But look, let me tell you this secret. Let me, let me explain this, right? The piriformis is not the only muscle in that buttock area, so it cannot be the only thing that contributes to someone's pain. We're gonna go through this in a bit more detail now, but the most important thing that we have to highlight with this is all of these different differentials have their own story, right? If someone's got buttock pain, there is gonna be a royal rumble of differential diagnoses and hypotheses that could be causing that individual's pain. Whether you've got someone who has lumbar spine, we'll take the, the lower back for example, right? If you have someone who has lower back pain or lumbar spine referred pain into the buttock and we can use the nerve or neuropathic component as an example here versus the person who maybe has soft tissue related buttock pain and you could refer that to either the piriformis, the uh, gamellae obturator component or any of those muscles around there that aren't just the piriformis, those will have a different way of presenting. If you have someone who has nerve-related pain, then often those symptoms can be induced or provoked and irritated by doing clinical tests, by testing the nerves, whether it's a straight leg raise, whether it's any sciatic nerve type stretch, often that will bring on symptoms if it has that nerve neuropathic or neural component versus if it's soft tissue, you won't really elicit that type of response. Equally, if you have someone, let's say, who has buttock pain as a result of GTPS or greater trochanteric pain syndrome, although that's often lateral hip pain, for those who have had this uh, symptoms for a long period of time, often that can dissipate and refer into the buttock. But the onset, the time, how long they've had it, the things that aggravate their symptoms are different to those who have lower back related referred pain. The things that provoke their pain when you're assessing it will differ. On one hand, if you're testing someone's nerve and that brings on the pain, heightens your index of suspicion that it could be a nerve entrapment. Equally, if you're then testing someone's lateral um, muscles, the glute med, the glute tendon, etc., and that brings on their pain, it starts to tell you a bit of a picture. So you're testing the nerve, or you're testing contractile tissue to see if it brings on the pain. But equally, we've got things like ischiofemoral impingement and proximal hamstring tendinopathy. And all of these start to fit into that umbrella term of deep gluteal pain syndrome. Now, deep gluteal pain syndrome is rare, but it does happen. But the difficulty with this component, and this is why we call it deep gluteal pain syndrome, is it covers those people who have piriformis pain 
It covers those people who have ischiofemoral impingement. It covers those people who have gemelli obturator complex type issues and equally covers those peripheral entrapment type patients because it is hard clinically, even with imaging, to definitively diagnose the structural cause that is causing someone's buttock pain. However, the important thing here is trying to be really clear. If someone has sciatic type symptoms, what we have to do is try and figure out, is it coming from the back or is it coming from somewhere peripheral? Are those symptoms peripherally irritating the nerve down the leg when you're stretching the structures. Now, this is the thing that I really want to focus on, specifically when it comes to a peripheral nerve entrapment. If you have a muscular cause that is putting that structure on a compression, so if the nerve is being compressed by the muscle, whether it's the piriformis, whether it's the gemelli complex, if you are stretching that muscle, if you are contracting that muscle and it is bringing on the neural symptoms, that is starting to give you an indication that that is playing a role. But it doesn't mean that the patient's pain is coming because the muscle is overworked or the muscle is tight and it needs to be stretched. What you're doing is essentially using that as a provocative tool. Now, the thing is here, if a prov provocative tool is a stretch, you go and look online, you go on YouTube, you go on any social media platform. So much of the management is around compressive stuff, sitting on a tennis ball, doing stretches. All of these things may actually be making symptoms worse where well, you're using it as a diagnostic tool. Now, equally, we have other things that we can consider that help our rationale. You know, I mentioned part of that deep gluteal syndrome umbrella is proximal hamstring tendinopathy. Now, a proximal hamstring tendinopathy is what it sounds like. It's a tendinopathy of where your hamstrings attach, right in your butt bone, right? You couldn't get more deep gluteal if you wanted. But that whole story and narrative is so different as well. Yes, we've got pain in the same area, but on one hand, we've got someone that's got a fairly vague, ambiguous, slow onset of symptoms versus someone who's maybe more athletic, had a change to training load, had a change to training intensity, had a mechanism of injury and an onset and a time frame from when symptoms start to develop. But equally, more importantly, symptoms are provoked with compressive and contractile testing of that structure. And that's where we have to make things a lot more specific. If your symptoms are coming from the piriformis or a soft tissue structure, can we reproduce those symptoms by addressing and testing those structures specifically, much like we would do with a proximal hamstring, much like we would do with a glute tendon, and much like we would do if we thought it was a disc-related pathology from the lumbar spine, when testing the movements of the lumbar spine and doing nerve stress tests as well to see it, if it plays a role. And then you have to consider all the other things. We still have sinister pathologies. We have to consider malignancies. We have to consider rheumatology, inflammatory and vascular components that are very rare, but still make up a minority of cases that may well present with deep buttock pain. So to say that it is just the piriformis that is driving it is really flawed. And often it is diagnosed without effective and accurate testing. However, what I wanna go through now is some of the key things that if you do have someone with deep gluteal pain symptoms, what we can do effectively to manage it and equally more importantly, to consider the things that might be provoking it or making it worse when it comes to stretches, when it comes to exercises, and equally when it comes to just general good rehab management. Right guys, think about this, right? If you've got a deep gluteal issue and you think it's a piriformis, it doesn't make sense if you've got an entrapment from the piriformis causing these kind of pseudo sciatic type symptoms to entrap it further. But if you think it's a piriformis, you still have to try and be specific. So we've got clinical tests, they're not 100%, but it's still useful to try, where you've got things like having the hip and knee in flexion, internal rotation of the hip and adding an adduction. And normally you would do this with someone palpating the sciatic notch, adding that stress into that position to see if it elicits your symptoms. Interestingly, what's a common exercise that patients will be given or find online for someone who's got some sort of hip pain, buttock pain, clamshells. Everyone gets given clamshells. Now, interestingly, the piriformis active test is kind of same sort of position, digging your heels together and bringing your knees apart and you'd have someone adding that resistance there to see if it elicits that pain. Now, this is also an exercise given to people. Now, you think we're doing this as a diagnostic test, 
but people are still being giving it as an exercise. Now, that's fine, right? That'll be fine if you had no pain. If you have no pain, all this stuff is absolutely fine to do, but we're talking about people who have got deep buttock pain. So if we have an exercise or a movement that is a provocation test used to diagnose or try and diagnose, it doesn't really make sense to try and use that as a treatment tool because it's going to provoke, provoke, provoke. Other things that commonly I see, which are quite provocative in these cases, are things like this. Seated stretches, leaning down, trying to stretch it out there. Again, if you don't have a pathology or a condition and your hips are just a bit tight, then that's fine. But if you have pain and you're unsure where it's coming from, whether it's the back, whether it's the deep gluteal space, whether it's the hip joint, sometimes this can be quite provocative, especially even if there is a soft tissue type problem there. And the stretches also, like these ones, these kind of hurdle type stretches, again, may well be given to try and loosen things up with good intentions, but may well provoke this situation, especially if you're not sure whether it's the joint, whether it's the deep gluteal space, whether there is a peripheral entrapment there also. The other elements and the other differentials and management around that that we can't disregard is that if we do, in some cases, have a deep gluteal problem or a peripheral entrapment from that buttock, we don't disregard what I just said. We, that's a significant focus. Don't irritate it, don't overload it. And just try and consider if it is overactive, where is it overactive? What are the synergists to the glute max, i.e. the posterior chain, that we can focus on with rehab to try and offset too much overload going through that particular area? Because what you don't want to do is irritate it. So some of these little tricks to try and offload and almost like focusing on the things that almost like not to do are just as important as trying to find out this perfect exercise. Because I'll tell you what, it's a complex area. There is not some magic one stretch that's gonna get rid of it. And unfortunately, that's why people go through this whole up and down scenario of trying to manage it. They don't know what to do. They do a ton of things that irritate it and they struggle to get better. Now let's talk about proximal hamstring tendons. That's another part you've got to think. Deep gluteal space syndrome just covers bum pain. Basically, I've got a pain in my butt. Now proximal hamstring tendinopathy in itself is a completely different condition you see it in an athletic population runners sprinters people that are really pushing themselves now the pain location is like it would probably make you think proximal hamstring which is kind of deep into the issue into that buttock area if you have someone who's got buttock pain as a result from that their irritability is going to be fairly apparent when you stress that hamstring either when you're doing things like leaning forward to touch your toes that stretch brings it on even if you're doing like a normal hamstring stretch, it brings it on. If you're getting them to try and do some sort of hamstring resistance, either at 90 degrees with a double leg bridge or a single leg bridge, will start to elicit their pain. So you're trying to test the hamstrings in a shortened position, in a lengthened position, contracting it in those positions and stretching it in those positions to see if it elicits those kind of symptoms in the buttock. Again, it brings us back down to testing contractile and compressive low tolerance of that tendon attachment into the sit bone, into the ischium. Now, if that is reproducing your pain and you suspect someone has deep gluteal pain from their proximal hamstring, what doesn't make sense? Grabbing one of these, grabbing a tennis ball, sitting on it and rolling on it or doing some stretches on it. Because what's that, what, I mean, what that is essentially going to do is irritate something which is already irritable. And actually, that's not going to make the tendon any stronger. But without solid evidence-based clinical reasoning as to what you think is going on, often, first portal call, this feels tight, this hurts. Stretch, foam roll, prod it, poke it, hope for the best. That doesn't really do the job. We're going to go through some exercises specifically for proximal hamstring tendon rehab, beginner, intermediate phases as well. And finally, certainly by no means least, actually something really important that needs to be considered when managing people who have deep gluteal pain syndrome, irrespective of the driver, if there is a peripheral nerve entrapment, there may well be some sciatic nerve 
tension. So one of the tools that we use to treat this often is something where I just refer to it to patients is almost like an exercise for your nerves, right? So you do loads of exercises for your muscles, loads of stretches and things like that. Um, and actually it's important to consider that if there is sciatic nerve tension, patients may find that it's difficult to stretch the nerve. And one of the exercises you could try would be this exercise where you pull the knee up to your chest, hug your thigh, point your toes up towards you if that's possible and just slowly straighten the leg up until you can feel pressure the back of the thigh and down the leg. Now it's worth noting these exercises can sometimes irritate um, as well as they can obviously help uh, more importantly but if you're doing it and it's starting to provoke your symptoms and definitely don't push, don't be too aggressive, just gradually just extend the leg up so you can feel that nerve stretch and glide it. So it just kind of comes on and off. And if it's too difficult with the toes pointed up, you can always relax the foot and do it with your toes pointed down in the other direction. Now that's only one part of doing this. You can utilize that same principle by doing other exercises. I'll show you this one, which I quite like. So remember, we've ruled out that proximal hamstring as a driver. We're doing this mainly as a tool to try and loosen up the nerve. So what you could do is even have a similar type of position where you've got this leg further forward, your right leg further back, keeping your toes up and just really slowly coming down and coming back up. So what would probably be given as a hamstring stretch, actually with the foot flexed up towards you, putting that sciatic nerve on tension. And as we stick our bum out, we're actually stretching the nerve and mobilizing it by us moving our trunk in this area here by sticking our bum out. Again, if that's too difficult to do, you can just start off by keeping the foot relaxed so it's slightly less stress on the sciatic nerve, but you can just stick your bum out, try and get a bit of a stretch on and see how that feels. And this is great because you can start wherever it feels most comfortable. It might be that you start with your feet together, feet flat, and just kind of hinge out and see how that helps. So then start to stagger your foot stance, start to move your foot position, and you can then progress even to the one that we just showed uh, on the floor earlier. So the sciatic mobilization techniques are useful. You've got to use them at the right time. You've got to dose them in the right way. You need to make sure it doesn't provoke the symptoms. Uh, and partly this is why we need to make sure that we settle symptoms down before starting to really work on strengthening things and mobilizing them, certainly too uh, robustly with the rehab.